Sermon text today will come from Ephesians in chapter 5. We'll begin where we left off last week. That'll be chapter 5 and verse 6. If you're in your pew Bibles, that's page 1822. It's obviously going to be different if you have your own Bible, a different page number, but that's Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. Let's begin there. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That's where I want to stop for our first pause this morning. And, and I want to point out that these verses begin with what, what should sort of terrify. It terrifies me every time I come across it in the scriptures and probably does you to some extent when you're honest and you let it sink in for a minute. And that is the subject and the teaching of the wrath of God. The wrath of God terrifies us as it should. The wrath of God is a terrible and awful thing to fall upon a person or a nation um, or, or even the earth itself, and we experience it in some lesser and greater ways. But in this particular text, where we hear about the wrath of God toward um, ungodliness, the wrath of God that comes toward those who are disobedient, I think it's important for us to understand that he's not speaking specifically about the wrath of God coming on us, insofar as the group I'm speaking to today are Christians. What I mean is that you are a, a person who puts your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been washed in his blood, forgiven by his grace. These verses are not aimed specifically at you. They're written for your benefit, to be sure, but they're not aimed specifically that God's wrath is going to come upon you. That becomes really clear as we look down into verse 8. It describes who we are. It says this, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And those verbs that are used are remarkable um, in some senses in the Greek. If you're familiar with the Greek language, then you'll, one of the things you'll notice is that participles are very often used as sort of an ongoing way to describe a present reality. But that is, in other words, if it were used here, it might say you are becoming light in the Lord. But I, I want you to notice that's not what's used here. Very definite verbs are used. It says, you were once darkness. You were that. Now you are light in the Lord. You are light. Which means that, that he's not speaking about the condemnation that comes on you. You are washed in the blood of Christ. You are saved by his grace. For you, this condemnation, this wrath that's being described is off the table for you. And this is important because it helps us understand that, that in our relationship with God, sometimes our focus is off. We often, in our, in our nature, want to think about the things that we do. But our relationship with God is not based on the things that we do, but who God has made us to be, our identity in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, as I think about this, I think it's important for us to realize that we once were darkness, now we are light in the Lord. We once were enemies of God, and now we are children of God. We'll see that in this next verse, children of God. A couple of months ago, I was driving with my son in the back seat, in his booster seat, and um, there was an ashtray. It's a, it's a 1997, so the, the, it was back in the days when they still had ashtrays in the car. Uh, there was an ashtray there in the back, and he was asking me, he said, Dad, what's this? And he was flipping it open and shutting open and shutting. I said, son, that's an ashtray. Please leave it alone. Do you think my three-year-old son left that ashtray alone? <laughs> he did not. He did not leave it alone. He kept flipping it up and down until finally the, ash, the top of the ashtray broke off. He broke it. And little did I know, he took that ashtray and he started poking holes in the ceiling of my car. I'm turning around going, what are you doing? Right? I'm, 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 I'm upset about this. Now, if it weren't your child, if it weren't your son, there were just some idiot in the back seat of your car that ripped off your ashtray and started poking holes in your car, what would you do? You pull over and you say, what the heck, man? Get out of my car. You can walk from here. 
right? I mean, that, that's, that's a natural response for someone who is not our child. But when it's our child in the back and, and he says, I'm sorry, Daddy, I didn't mean to. Then how do you respond? You go, ah, I forgive you, son. Please don't do that anymore. Right? There's a, there's a different sort of response. And what's the difference? Is it behavior? The behavior is the exact same, isn't it? But here's the difference. One of them is someone that is, that is not my son. And the other one, the other one's my child. The other one's mine, right? And here's, here's the truth of this scripture that our relationship to God is not built on what we do or we don't do. Our relationship with God is built on the fact that He has made us His children. His children. Which means that we have the forgiveness and the access of a heavenly Father. Now you may say, well then what then of these verses of wrath? Why are they put in here? Well, I think even as children, it's important for us to understand that, that the God we love, the God who is just and the ruler of the universe, is angry with sin. Even if that anger doesn't ultimately get directed at us, even if we don't finally get what we deserve in that regard, it's important for us to look out into the world and see that God is not pleased with sin. The verse 6 says this, Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And, and, and I think we can even have a clearer picture of what, that, what disobedience Paul has in mind if you go back up to the fifth verse. For this you can be sure, no immoral or impure person uh, or greedy person who is an idolater. That immoral is porneia. It has to do with sexual immorality. And so here he's lifting up this sexual immorality and this uh, greediness. And he's saying that God's wrath is revealed against people who live their lives this way. And we as children of God, who, who even though we may struggle against such sins, even though the punishment for those sins has been absorbed for us in the cross of Christ, it's important for us to note the way that God deals with these sins in the world, to look at them, to see where that path leads. And perhaps in our own time, there's never been a clearer picture for us to, to do exactly what this verse says, to not be deceived, to look clear-eyed at the way that God handles porneia, sexual immorality, and greed. Perhaps nowhere do we see it more clearly than in the, the most recent case of Jeffrey Epstein, do we? A man who was one of the richest in all of the United States of America, and yet engaged in such sexual immorality that it becomes appalling to us when it comes to the light and what is his fate you children of god you children of the light what is the fate of such darkness such immorality a man who's for all his wealth he couldn't help but end up alone committing suicide in a dingy cell the wrath of god is revealed against such unrighteousness do you see it clearly God, God gives us these pictures, not to, not to frighten us, not to say, if you don't, I'm going to bring this down on you, but so that we might have an assurance that we living in light are living the course that God desires and the, the path of darkness ends, ends like that in the wrath of God. We continue then to see the way instead of living in the darkness of this world, we are to live as children of the light. We continue that in the, the next part of verse 8 and on. There, the Spirit writes through Paul, live as, live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord. Too many Christians, too many, too many good Christians who, who'd want to love the Lord more and more are living, instead of in love, they're living in the fear of God. They're living in fear of God as some sort of enemy who wants to drop the boom on them instead of as a loving father who desires their, uh, their joy and their completeness. Too many Christians are living as though they're afraid to go to hell when the reality is that you who have put your trust in Christ have been forgiven by His grace, washed in His blood. Understand, hell is off the table for you. It's not an axe hanging over your head. It will never be. 
If you truly have your faith rested in Jesus Christ so that you trust him more than anything else and you, you live your life in commitment to his truth and his life and his goodness, friends, hell is not something you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to walk down the street and, oh, accidentally commit a sin and boom, all of a sudden I've lost my salvation and I'm falling into hell. That's not the way this works. In fact, I'll give you an example as I consider my own life and, and what Ephesians teaches from the beginning to the end. God considers the case of John Flug. The before, the, before the foundation of the world, it says in Ephesians 1. He, he opens my case file, so to speak. And he looks at all the sins that I have ever committed. And he sees my life even more clearly than I do all the way to the end. And he considers all the sins not just that I have committed. He considers all the sins that I will commit. And understandably, the just punishment against that, those sins is the wrath of God. God is angry toward my sin. And I deserve eternal punishment and death. That's what the case file demands. But instead, before the case is closed, Christ says, this one's mine. My blood covers this. My cro- the, the, the death that I suffered on the cross absorbs the wrath of God so that all of the sins of my life, past, present, and future, knowing what I've done, knowing that I will do, have been covered in Christ. I've been forgiven. And if your faith is in Him, you have been too. So that, so that hell is off the table for us as Christians. And if we're going to live as Christians, then we have to find a new way to live. Not in the fear of what God's going to do if we screw up, but instead in the, in the joy of what God has set us free to do. Um, as, as we consider... As we consider this, it's a, an often an objection that's noted by many Christians, and in fact, Paul even deals with this objection in Romans. They'll say, okay, I hear what you're saying, preacher, that Christians are completely forgiven of their sins, all the past, present, and future. Doesn't that mean that all of a sudden then Christians can just say, well, I guess I'll just do whatever I want, right? I've been forgiven by the grace of God. Can't I just, you know, sin, do whatever I want to do since I've been forgiven by God's grace? Then it won't matter. I won't go to hell. Right? So you, you, I, I'm thinking about uh, a, someone I knew in high school, and you probably all knew someone like this in high school, who had a really rich mom or dad. I'm the person I'm thinking of had a really rich father who was a lawyer in town. And anytime this person um, got in trouble, daddy's money would get him off the hook. You know people like that? As soon as she turned 16, there's a, a car for her. As soon as she wrecked that car, it was in the shop and fixed the next day. I mean, just daddy's money fixed all this. And morally speaking, often people will think about Christians this way, and they'll think, well, you Christians, you think you're just forgiven for all your sins. Morally speaking, you can just do whatever you want, and and your Heavenly Father's grace will cover it all, right? In one sense, and theoretically, is this true? Yeah, theoretically. Theoretically, this is the case, that God's grace has covered our sins. There's nothing we can do that goes beyond the forgiveness and the shed blood of Christ. But in the actuality, what happens is we become children of light so that even though it's possible for us to sin and quote unquote do whatever we want and be forgiven by the grace of God, the reality of a conversion is not that we get to be forgiven of our sins and we get to get heaven. That's not the good news. The good news of the gospel is Jesus Christ himself. And that we would want Christ. A converted heart is not one that gets a free pass into heaven. A converted heart is a heart that wants to want what God wants. That desires to have the same mind that God has. A converted heart changes not what we do, but what we want. And that ultimately does, of course, change what we do. But but friends, what we do is not the gospel. It's it's the condition of the heart, the orientation of our desires. So really what we're looking at then is not for a preacher to preach the gospel by saying, well, you better stop sinning. But rather, a preacher who will say from the pulpit boldly and clearly what's said here in verse 10, find out what pleases the Lord. When you have a converted heart, that's what pleases you, is pleasing the Lord. And and it's not that difficult to even to understand. It's 
what these verses say in verse 9. What is goodness and righteousness and truth? What's good and right and true? Man, I, I, I was thinking about this morning, how can I make that a more profound truth? Something that sinks in deeper. But I don't need to. I mean, it's really simple. What's good and right and true? And do that. That pleases the Lord. Do what's good and right and true. And, and therein we begin to please the Lord. And it's a different way of living to ask that question than it is, oh, what, what do I need to avoid in order to, uh, you know, not go to hell? That's a different, that's not the gospel question. The gospel question is, what's good and right and true? And how do I find the joy of the Lord in it? Okay, last verses we'll look at today. Um, verse 11 to 14. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. These verses begin by saying it's sinful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. And it's important again to remember that he's not speaking about you. He's speaking for your benefit, but he's not speaking about you. He's speaking about the disobedient, those who are apart from Christ. And what they do in secret is shameful. Now you say, does that mean Christians never do shameful things in secret? No, not necessarily. But here's the difference. Christians can't do shameful things in secret and be all right with it in their body, in their mind, in their soul. There's a discontent with it. When you commit a sin in secret and no one else knows about it, you know that God knows and it doesn't sit right with you. But that's not true of the world that we live in. The world that we live in is just fine doing shameful deeds in secret. And we're shocked as the world whenever these shameful things that have been done in secret come to light, right? These make the headlines. These are all the big things. But the truth is we shouldn't be all that shocked. It's right here in the Word of God. We live in a world where shameful things are being done in secret, in the darkness. And yet we're called to live differently than that. We're called to live a life of light. To stand in contrast to that. Even sometimes in our own life. As a light in the world, it says you are light. You can't be comfortable in that darkness anymore. It doesn't mean you're not there some, in some areas of your life, but you're not comfortable there, are you? And so the command here is, if you're not comfortable there, quit it. Move into the light because you are light. You are light, and it makes sense here. But not only that, if you look at verse 11, there's an interesting, um, an interesting little verse there I want to sort of draw our thoughts to as we draw near to the end here. And it's this, have nothing to do, verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Here we are, Christians, commanded by the word of our God to expose unrighteousness and darkness in this world. And this stands in contrast to what the world wants to say. They, the world wants to say, hell on you, Christians. You just need to keep your mouth shut and fade into the background and let the world do what it does. You need to not tell us what to do because Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged, right? Have you heard that before from outsiders accusing Christians of hypocrisy? Judge not lest ye be judged. Well, here it says expose them. Expose them who are unrighteous. So how do we reconcile that? Well, here, here's what I think. The, the quote that's often brought up, judge not, least ye be judged, comes from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. And in that same context, immediately after Jesus says that, judge not, lest ye be judged, he also goes into this, um, this speech about a log in an eye, right? He says, before you try to remove the splinter from your neighbor's eye, Remove the log from your own eye. And in that sense, Jesus is right. Don't judge while you've got problems in and with your own life. And the truth is we should never judge someone else from the perspective of our own lives. I think that it is right to cheer for the Cowboys. And some of you think I'm wrong about that. But I'm not going to lecture you about which team you should cheer for because that's doing so from my own perspective, right? From from my own faults and my own brokenness, and we should not judge people that way. But it doesn't mean that there's not a judgment in the world. It doesn't mean that there's not one who has the right to judge. We're told that this word, your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp to my feet 
and a light to my path. That we as Christians are not to point to ourselves as the ultimate judge of all things, but to point to God in His Word as the ultimate judge of all things. And His Word stands in contrast to the way that the world thinks about things. It just does. As light stands in contrast to darkness, His Word's going to stand in contrast to the way that the world considers things. And so as we, we as Christians are called to do this, expose them. Not, not necessarily lift ourselves up as the banner and the herald of all truth. We know we've got brokenness and we've got issues that we've been forgiven of. But to put that light out there. Now I know as we put forward Christian truth, biblical truth into the culture, there's going to be pushback against it. And some people are going to run away from it. And here's why. Because men love darkness what Jesus says in John chapter 3 they don't want to be exposed for what they're doing and the Bible does exactly that it exposes sinfulness but here's the other thing I, and, I, and I know for that reason it's painful for us nobody wants to expose another person but here's why we must because only in shining the light into the darkness will people ever understand that there is a light there are so many people who live in a desperate darkness that need the light of Christ and how will they ever hear? How will they ever know, Christians, if we don't extend the light of the gospel, if we don't expose the world of darkness to the only light that there is in this world, the light of Jesus Christ? I encourage you, be grounded in the Word of God. Learn what pleases Him through His Word. And then be, be willing to shine that light into the world as, in the way that we live as a contrast to darkness. One final thought as we wrap up. These last verses say this, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's a, a quote almost certainly from Isaiah chapter 60, which Gary read at the beginning. But these words are the words of God, and only the words of God have the power to bring dead men to life. Jesus spoke, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, who had been dead for three days, at the command, at the word of Christ, came up from the dead. I can tell you all day long what you should and shouldn't do. The things you should do to please God and the things you should avoid to displease Him and avoid His wrath, I can tell you and make lists for you if you want. But I can never make you want it. Because the truth is we're born into this world in spiritual darkness and death. Your spiritual condition apart from Christ is dead. Dead. Dead men don't come to life on their own. But the word of Christ is able to bring to spiritual life. Friends, today maybe, maybe some of you have been listening and you said, I'm, I'm hearing this like I'm the, on the outside in. I want in. I want the light. I, I beg you, friends, hear these words today because they and they alone can begin to change our wants, our desires. Wake up, O oh sleeper. I beg you, wake up. Wake up from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. You will come from being darkness to the point where you are now light. Light in this world. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of His people. Amen.